Thank you. Glenview Capital's Larry Robbins has taken the stage to present his best idea. I talk to you about Let's why we should in. be short big pharma and medium pharma on pricing concerns. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, shorting 3M and Kimur's on PFAS, which stands for per and polyfluoral alkali substances. Uh, the last time I will say that, I will now use PFAS because I'm good with numbers but not so good with words. At the end of the story, I'm also going to tell you about an incredible young man named Maurice Campbell, a hockey player who's using things he learned from his family and Horace Mann uh, in the North Jersey Avalanche to kick cancer's butt as he goes through his battle. So I can't wait to talk to you about that, but first, let's pay some bills and do the real content, right? <clears throat> when analyzing stocks, you need to look at the political risk. You need to figure out who's the decision maker. Stocks that have uh, been sensitive to Medicare for all or the concept of mandatory Medicare have gone straight backwards since February. However, you need to understand that it's not just a presidential candidate or a president that can make it happen. You need both chambers of Congress, including likely 60 members of the Senate, right, and the president all to agree to it, right? The odds are extremely low. We'll talk about that. Whereas in pharma, because of something called the CMMI that was passed under the ACA, right, in pharma, the president can act unilaterally to reduce drug pricing, and in fact, uh, President Trump is attempting to, and regardless of who the presidential candidate is or president is in 2021, we believe all will seek to act. Finally, uh, we think PFAS makers uh, are ethical companies, but they made a product that causes harm, and they're going to have to pay for uh, the remediation of that. Uh, what can we see? We can see that the companies, including the HMOs and the hospitals that we own are growing and growing rapidly. We see that the stocks have fallen. That creates the compressed spring and opportunity for you all. Whereas while the uh, pharma shorts and Triple M and, and Kimur's have done admirably or okay in the, in the market, they're facing some very, very significant liabilities. What is mandatory Medicare or what is uh, Medicare for all? It means that you will replace current Medicare. It means you will replace current Medicaid. It means you will eliminate private insurers. It means that 82% of the country that is chosen private insurance will no longer have that right or access to their own insurers and instead we're going to spend 30 trillion plus right and how are we going to pay for it we don't know who's the single payer of single payer health care you are it's the taxpayer federal government will be the single allocator when you pose it like that it doesn't sound quite as good so don't pay attention to the polling numbers. Is Medicare for all good? Sure. Everybody should have health care. Medicare for all isn't universal health care. It's eliminating what we have in favor of something new that probably won't work. What's broken? There's still 28 million Americans that don't have health insurance. It'll shock you to know that half of them actually have access today. They just haven't signed up. Five and a half million are eligible for Medicaid. They just haven't done the, the paperwork. And another 10 million at a cost of no more than $100 a month are eligible for Obamacare exchanges. And they choose not to pay for it because people were against the individual mandate. People don't like when things are mandatory in the U.S. How is it going to happen that you're going to have mandatory Medicaid? What is working? There's 85% customer satisfaction. What would Glenview do if we were king for a day? We're not going to be king for a day. There's plenty of good ideas that can uh, eliminate this coverage gap. We do think it's a, a laudable goal that all Americans have access to affordable health care insurance. How could you get Medicare for all passed? Democrats have to win the White House in, 20, in 2020. For the purpose of this room, we'll just say, hey, that's 50-50. But only three of the candidates, which have a collective 28% share of, uh, of, of, of voters, of early voters, are really supportive of Medicare for all, right? And then you have to flip the Senate from 53-47 to 50-50. And then you got to get over the fact that 15 senators that are Democrats currently oppose Medicare for all. And then, of course, you need to get past the bird rule, which says if we're going to spend money, 60 senators need to approve it. And last time I checked, $30 trillion is spending money, right? Who does not seem excited about Medicare for all? Three of the top four Democrats uh, in, in, the, in the House of Representatives, as well as three of the four key chairs. Here's their quotes. The idea that overnight you're going to take 20% of the American economy and transform it like the DMV or other or the VA hospital system and transform it, that's not really realistic, right? It hasn't been good service, right? If you guys are political wonks, you'll know that 34 Senate seats come up in 2020. Ten of them are considered quote-unquote contested, one of which is the Alabama seat that was lost in the Roy Moore scandal. Alabama, last time we checked, is a pretty red Republican state. That means that you basically have to go seven and two if you're a Democrat in the next election in contested races. And by the way, that includes the fact that three people who are running again won by 8% or more. Those are very, very tall odds. The high, high likelihood is that whether, no matter
matter what your affiliation, the betting odds are that the Senate is going to stay Republican, right? There's 15 uh, Democratic senators that all oppose Medicare for All, right? Medicare for All insurance takes away insurance from 180 million people, right? The number one job of an elected official is to get reelected. You try not to infuriate 180 million people that in general like what they have. That's from a Democratic senator uh, from Colorado, right? Well, maybe even if you get that, you could say, all right, well, if you get past the 15 senators and you win four seats net of Alabama and, and, and get to 50-50, then you got to get past how do you need 60 votes in the Senate. Well, even uh, Bernie Sanders' presidential candidate, who's the, one of the principal architects of Medicare for All, says, no, I'm not that crazy about getting rid of the filibuster, which is what you need to get to 60 votes, right? In the ACA, which was the only revolutionary uh, health care legislation that we've had in the last decade, Right? Uh, most industry groups were actually for it because with good conscience it's a good idea that all Americans have access to health insurance. When we look at Medicare for All today, literally everyone is opposed. Right? What happens if I'm a pollster and I say, hey, do we like Medicare for All? Sure. Right? What if that means you eliminate your private insurance? Well, maybe. Right? If it requires you to pay more taxes, now we're starting to cut in our pocketbooks. Right? Threatens the current Medicare program, now seniors really don't like it. Right? And leads to delays in getting people treatments. It will take three times as long to get an MRI in a single payer system like the UK as it takes in the US. How frustrated have we all been that we can't get our kids or our parents an MRI in a reasonable period of time, try tripling that weight. That's a lot of calls to mom to explain it. All right? What about, hey, a uh, single payer means that all of for-profit health care, including insurers, disappears. Except for single payer in Canada, in which 67% of people still have private insurance. Or South Korea at 77. Or Japan at 90. Even though we're not single payer, only 82% of people have private insurance today. 18% are through Medicare and Medicaid. We're kind of in line with the world already. Right? What's the uh, customer satisfaction scores? They're pretty high. People who have insurance have an 85 plus percent positive rating about their insurance. What about states? States have an ability to decide, do we want to run this ourselves or do we want to outsource it to these big bad companies known as for-profit insurers? Pennsylvania is saving $5 billion over 10 years. Ohio is saving 17 percent. With how stretched state budgets are and voters are and we really need higher taxes as middle income Americans are trying to make ends meet. Isn't it a good idea to save money rather than to spend more money? What does that lead to in terms of our investment decisions? It means that right now as a result of the fact that the earnings are up and the stock prices are down, multiples are compressed. Currently we're trading at about 73% relative multiple to the market, right? Where have they traditionally traded when there's not a uh, political crisis? They traditionally traded between 90 and 110% relative multiple, which means over a two-year period, you're likely to make 50 to 85% if you buy the group, and we like uh, certain stocks better than the group. Well, gee, how are the companies doing right now? Well, we just finished the first quarter reporting period. Cigna, Humana, United Healthcare, Anthem, Centene, all companies that we own in our portfolio. They all beat the first quarter. They all raised guidance. How did they beat and raise? Because they did a better job of using innovation and modern tools and scale to reduce the medical cost trend, which ultimately will be passed along next year in the form of uh, uh, lower premiums or premiums that increase at a slower rate than they otherwise would. As we look at target prices, we think that these stocks should be trading at 16 to 20 times earnings in line with the 90 to 110 percent market multiple. That leads to some fancy uh, upside. Uh, Cigna is certainly our favorite among those group. What about hospitals? Wall Street said, well, gee, if you get rid of commercial pay and commercial pay pays more for a hospital than Medicare or Medicaid, then isn't that bad for hospitals and they're all going to go out of business? All 5,300 hospitals in the United States, they're suddenly going to go out of business. Right? And so, okay, well, the HCA, they had great numbers, they raised numbers, uh, they're generating great cash flow. By the way, HCA bought back 16% of their stock in the third quarter of 2011 at net $12 a share net of dividends. They're going to earn more than $12 a share next year, right? And yet, hey, we got to be careful because, hey, aren't they going to get rid of commercial insurance? Well, if you get rid of commercial insurance, you also get rid of bad debt expense, and you have increased coverage, and a private market will emerge just like it has in every other single-payer system. So we don't think it's, even if you get through the 0.002% that Medicare for All happens, we still don't think hospitals are that bad off. But what really happens? What really happens is that out of those 5,300 hospitals, there's 1,600 of them today who are community hospitals, who are not-for-profits, who lose money, who will get driven out of business. 
And by the way, there's 12 hospitals in every congressional district on average, and by the way, they're the second largest employer through the district, and reimbursement to hospital procedures have gone up for next year as passed by this Congress by 2.5 to 3% because they are so vital to engines and growth. Hospitals are not under attack. Hospitals are a wonderful place to invest. What about in Australia and the UK where they do have single-payer systems? Don't the hospitals make no money? No, actually, they make the same margins, almost 15 versus almost 15. What multiples do they trade at? They must trade at horrible multiples. Actually, they traded double the multiples. As a hospital investor, we just should almost hope that mandatory Medicare happens just so our multiples can double, but that's not going to happen, right? How cheap are these things? They're between six and ten times next year's earnings. Each of them to their leverage uh, uh, goals can buy back 30 percent, three zero percent of their current market cap between now and the end of 2020. Now, they may not do that. They may delever more. They may invest more in their business. They may uh, do M&A, but they certainly have the firepower, right? And they do that for double the growth. And finally, right, uh, I mentioned HCA has accelerating organic EBITDA, UHS has a behavioral turnaround, which is an input process, and Tenant Healthcare has ongoing cost saves uh, with a visibility to 2020 EBITDA growth of mid to high single digits. Um, again, we think that there's between 64 and 200 percent uh, price appreciation that's coming over the next couple of years back to normalized multiples. What about pharma? Pharma is riskier. Why? Because the same drug in the United States costs three times as much as it costs in other OECD countries. Right? So the average Joe is paying $36,000 for Humira, right? whereas somebody in the UK is paying $11,000 for that same exact drug. It's a trade issue. Right? Uh, uh, Secretary Azar is right. This is a trade issue. We want pharma companies to innovate, to create life-saving medicines for the people, including the people that Sone care about. We want them to do it in a fair way that doesn't do it on the back of Americans who can't afford their own prescriptions. The CMMI, which was created, has, gives the president the power to make mandatory changes. Right? Democrats and Republicans agree on only one thing in life, and that's the drug prices are too high. And if you're worried about a Bernie Sanders or a Kamala Harris or a very progressive liberal presidential candidate in 2021 taking over and that that's going to be bad for health care, they can act unilaterally without Congress's approval in order to substantially reduce the price they pay for pharmaceuticals, right? We would recommend shorting either a pharma in index, any kind of pharma ETF. Uh, we have three lungs and 16 shorts in pharma. We look for high multiples where there's LOEs. We look for a big spread between U.S. and non-U.S. prices. Um, and then exposure to biosimilars because we do think biosimilar wave is actually really coming. Finally, right, we know that we've seen big moves in J&J &J and in Bayer around contingent liabilities around talc and around glyphosate. Right? What has been less talked about in the financial press but more talked about in the legal system is the impact of PFAS right, to the companies that made it. Right? What is PFAS? It was invented as a forever chemical. It was designed around the Manhattan Project. It was originally used to survive anything, to survive a nuclear bomb. Why do they call it forever? It's a half-life of nearly forever. It's very, very difficult to remediate. Right? We can see the quote, right? one of the seminal public health challenges for the next decades. That's from the US CDC. Right? What's it used for? Everything. It's got a lot of good uses, like most chemicals and innovation, right? Scotch guard and lots of good things that help in our lives, but unfortunately has some unintended health consequences that aren't good. Right? There's allegations against 3M from a variety of lawsuits. In red is what they knew. In yellow is what they suppressed. Right? You don't have to be Aaron Brockovich to realize that this is not a good fact pattern for a corporation that is being sued by multiple states and multiple individuals, and there are states which are trying to reduce um, uh, sevenfold the national talked about uh, uh, level of acceptable PFAS in the drinking supply. We know that since uh, 2015, 3M's number of lawsuits that they've been involved with went up 87-fold. We know that their uh, accruals for uh, environmental liabilities went up 8%. So yeah, they took a charge in the first quarter and said, oh, don't worry, it's ring-fenced. No, it's not. Right? It's not ring-fenced. In fact, this company, 12 days after they filed their 2017 10K in early 2018, then, and they had a $53 million reserve, they then paid out an $840 million settlement to the state of Minnesota. Let's not kid ourselves that this company is fully reserved. Right? Uh, it's more active if we track Google searches and increasing public focus. Right? It's up about 10 times right, and doubling again. We know that uh, 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 representatives, like the Democrat representative in California says, we cannot and must not ignore the role of large corporations like 3M, and the, he says DuPont, but it's really Camores. We'll talk about that in a second. 
right? What are the filing ranges? We think that based upon cases filed, 3M owes four to six billion, and if they have to remediate, the industry owes 47 to 330 billion dollars. Yes, that's real math. No, that's not made up. How come it's so expensive? Because they're forever chemicals, right? Uh, when DuPont spin off Comores, and then afterwards there was a settlement, they paid Comores in order to take the liabilities. The liabilities are now Comores. Every time you see DuPont's losing a suit, you should assume that that liability will stay with Comores. Comores also has four to six billion, which is 60 to 100% of its current market cap. Right? Finally, ESG investing, environmental, social, and governments is a new hot topic. Who rates these things? There's rating agencies like Sustainalytics. What does Sustainalytics rate 3M? They give it its highest industrial rating. It's number 35 in the S&P 500. Do we really need a Dyer Sohn conference to talk about rating agencies again and the fact that we shouldn't be relying on rating agencies in order to make our investments? 3M trades at 19 and a half times earnings with a giant liability that we think will suppress its valuation. CC is facing a liability that we think is worth uh, potentially substantially all of its market cap.